We are um, at our first section test uh, relating to uh, Plato's five dialogues, the Socrates material, the Apology, and the Credo, and Plato's Phaedrus, the later dialogue, which I consider to be Plato. Um, we're making that distinction here. Um, so uh, this video will go over your first section test, which I posted today to Moodle early. Um, and uh, basically what I'm going to do is go over each of the questions, um, some general policies for um, writing these tests, what's required, what's expected, that sort of thing, just so that hopefully I've answered uh, a, a number of your questions before you even have them. Um, also about these videos, I tend to give you too much um, with regard to um, it, how to go about answering these questions. So these videos hopefully will be a good asset for you. Um, so um, philosophy 1100 section uh, test number one, um, which is due uh, Monday, October 9th um, at noon, 12 p.m. Uh, so, uh, the section tests, um, there's some boilerplate taken from the, uh, the course syllabus here. I've edited some of it out, um, like you know, where it says dates indicated below because they're not indicated below. They're indicated on the course syllabus, uh, both on the, uh, the, 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 the proposed timetable for the class and in other spots. I tend to be redundant with that sort of thing. Um, you'll, you'll have basically at least five days with this material. It's going to be a week um, since, since I'm early with this. And um, basically, I come off as hard saying no late assignments will be accepted. Now, there's a caveat to that um, with regard to the missed assignment policy. Uh, basically, what I'm saying is that if you need an extension, then that extension um, requires a conversation. Right? So you have to get in touch with me, preferably before the deadline that you're missing, or um, within 12 hours of that deadline, um, with an excuse that's not, you know, I just didn't get to it, but rather a decent excuse kind of thing. Uh, basically, what I'm saying is that if life happens, and I completely understand that life happens, um, I will work with you, but that requires a conversation. That's all. Um, assignment submission, uh, what you're going to be doing is uploading a single file. Um, it, this is not a time test. Uh, it's uh, available as soon as you've got these resources and you've got all of the time in the world. You've got the questions, you've got your books, you've got the videos, you've got the internet, you've got the forums, you've got, you've got all of the resources you could possibly want with regard to uh, crafting your responses and developing your understanding of this material. This is why I lay these tests out um, this way. I don't like a do or die test. It's a do or learn how to do kind of test and I'm trying to give you the time uh, to really succeed here. Um, uh, so assignment submission, um, uh, there, there are a few places that um, uh, students have trouble with regard to submitting this assignment if they're going to have trouble submitting this assignment. Um, if, first off, give yourself plenty of time. Um, it, submit it early. Plan to have it done before noon on Monday, right? So uh, that way at 12.01 um, uh, or 12.10 uh, when uh, the portal will not accept your assignment, um, it, you're in a bind, right? And uh, effectively your only option will be to email me your, your assignment and um, some sort of explanation as to why it wasn't in on time. I'm giving you lots of time, um, so please, please use that time. Also, um, it, make sure that um, your assignment is uploaded properly. Right? Um, if you're nervous about it um, before the deadline, uh, also email me a copy and then that way you know that I have it um, because things happen. Right? So it's better to leave yourself with a backup. Um, another thing is make sure you've uploaded the correct document, not a draft of the document, not your homework for another class, um, because I, I can only grade what you submit. And if you haven't submitted a complete assignment, 
that is by, by, by submitting a draft, or if you would submit an assignment for another class erroneously, uh, well, your, your, your analysis of Faulkner or O. Henry or something along those lines is interesting to me. I have interests in these things. It's not a response to questions regarding the Socrates and Plato material, which are the content of this course. So this is where the grades are. Um, it, so it, it, effectively, what I'm saying is you, it, I will grade it and I will give it due time and attention, uh, but you, you, it's on you to get it to me, basically. Right? Um, and uh, one final note, um, as I've noted extensively in the syllabus and in the welcome video as well, uh, we have a zero tolerance policy on plagiarism in this class. Um, if, if you're nervous about plagiarism uh, on the course syllabus, I've given you the link to the uh, the site right sort of online training thing. Um, if you're nervous about it, go through that. Um, it takes a couple of hours, and um, it's actually pretty good, right? So. Um, uh, the idea is that um, I'm, I'm giving you all of the time and resources you need. This is generally how academics work. Uh, we've got time, we've got resources, we've got online resources, we have discussions with our colleagues about the material that we're writing about, etc., etc., etc. And uh, in the end, what we're expected to produce is pretty good, right? Now, you've got basically the time and the resources and the ability to have conversations with your colleagues in the class through the forums or in person if you know them. Um, and what you're expected to come at, up with at the end is pretty good. But at the same time, just like academics are expected to produce original work, you're in an academic scenario and you are expected to produce original work and those points where you've used resources other than the contents of your own noggin um, it, effectively you're supposed to make a clear distinction between what is yours and what you're grabbing from somewhere else right um, before you ask with regard to reference style i don't care mla pa chicago pick one be consistent right at this point, in for a first year class, this is Phil 1100, um, I care that you reference. How you reference, it, that, that, that'll that be discipline specific and come later. Right? So um, I consider everything um, that I've posted to Moodle for you guys, all of the contents of the video, all of the contents of um, my videos, that sort of thing, the textbooks, all of that is fair game for these tests. Um, it, for this first one, I've, I've relied pretty close to the text itself, but this reflects um, sort of the discussion that we've been having uh, virtually um, through Moodle as well. So um, it's, I list off the, the resources that um, it, you're expected to have engaged with that will inform your responses. I'm assuming you know this stuff. And um, I'm expecting that some of this comes out in uh, your responses to these questions. So um, they are short answer questions um, uh, requiring a minimum of two paragraphs response each. Um, it, just defining things, um, a paragraph is minimally three sentences. If you've got two sentences, you don't have a paragraph. Um, so, uh, largely, um, what I'm saying here is I'm, I'm, I'm expecting a solid effort in terms of writing. I'm expecting full sentences, um, not point form that's too vague. I have to do too much to a point form response to actually make it make sense. Um, so, uh, you're expected to actually communicate clearly and effectively about ideas and abstract notions. And it's one of the cross-cutting capacities for the course. So uh, these assignments have to reflect that. Um, also, uh, I've just defined um, a paragraph as a bare minimum of three sentences, but I also note here that your responses are expected to sort of exceed this minimum. Basically, when I tell you minimums, I'm telling you how to do sort of bare passy with regard to the course. Basically what I'm looking for is 
And you'll see with these questions, I'm asking you to do a bit, right, with uh, regard to analyzing these positions and um, it, making an argument in some cases, or minimally offering a, a critical evaluation of an argument, making a distinction, etc. Right, so uh, these are weighty questions. You're expected to write a little bit. Right, so um, anyhow, five points each for these questions um, uh, for a total of 30 points. Um, you see the way that that fits into your grade from uh, your glance at this, the fourth syllabus. So um, let's uh, get to the questions. Um, so it's going to be three on Socrates and three on Plato. Right, so it's fairly straightforward that way. Um, question number one. In the early part of Socrates' trial defense, so immediately, you know, that's the apologia or defense, um, uh, he relates a story of how he became know, uh, known as, quote, the wisest man in Athens. The story introduces an epistemological position wherein, quote, human wisdom is worth little or nothing. That's in Five Dialogues, page 27. Uh, but on this base, uh, the basis of this epistemological claim, Socrates is still able to ground or establish positive ethical claims. What I want you to do is discuss this transition from epistemology to ethics. Right. So basically, I know that I know nothing. Right. And he goes through, it. if I were answering this, I, I might actually follow the structure of the argument, right? So why is Socrates the wisest man in Athens? Because he alone knows that he knows nothing. Well, how does he test his wisdom and how does his disposition to this epistemological claim suggest sort of an example of how we should respond to this epistemological position ethically, right? And um, it's, I gave you lots of material with regard to how to go about responding to this question in terms of the video material. Um, so uh, that should hopefully uh, be straightforward. One of the things that you have to do with these questions is break them down into their various parts, right? So how does Socrates start with that wisest man in Athens, unpack it for the epistemological claim? and then make the move to ethics, right? So it's sort of a three-parter, right? So um, that will be uh, the first question. Question two, Socrates on page 35 of the five dialogues presents an argument where he compares himself to a gadfly. So the first thing you have to do is answer this question. In what respect is he like a gadfly? So unpack the metaphor. It, so he's like a gadfly, how? Right? Well, what does a gadfly do? It stings the noble yet sluggish steed of the city-state of Athens. In what respect is the city-state noble and yet sluggish? Right? And how does he sting that steed? Right? Which you've just sort of unpacked a little bit in the first question anyway. Right? Um, and the second part of that statement. Why is this important by his argument to the city-state of Athens? Right. Related to that second part, outlining the argument for democracy, we discussed as part of the videos, um, how does the gadfly argument support a case for the protected rights of freedom of speech and by extension in our politi modern political context, freedom of the press? You see, what I think is interesting about how Socrates lays out this argument right, is that democracy is good because, that is, democracy as a political system is instrumentally valuable because it relies on the expression of these human capacities. Right? If democracy is instrumentally valuable and it relies upon the expression of these human capacities, why would we need the ability to express these human capacities to stand as a protected right in the context of democracy so it can achieve its own ends, right? You see, this is an example of how I'm giving you too much, but um, nonetheless, uh, again, in the videos I discussed this 
sort of extensively, so you should have lots of material for that. And then I follow up with one question on the credo. Question number three, and then we're done with Socrates. In his, fictional, in his fictional conversation with the laws of Athens, Socrates introduces the distinct but related notions of the social contract and of tacit consent. Briefly outline this argument, defining each of these distinct notions. So uh, basically what you want to do is follow the argument right, uh, that Socrates has with the fictional character of the laws of Athens, right? and it define, it define and distinguish between the social contract and tacit consent, right? and then follow this up um, with an analysis of this argument. By your analysis of this argument, what sort of duties are implicit in democratic citizenship? Right? Now, you see, this is the distinction between the Gadfly argument and what's going on in um, the Credo. Right? I like to think of these dialogues um, as complementary to one another. Well, Socrates in his defense is making a case for the protective right, uh, protected rights of freedom of speech and freedom of uh, the press by extension right, um, in the modern political context. Right. It, these rights should be product, uh, protected so that democracy can achieve its own ends. What the Credo points out is sort of what I've termed as a failing of Socrates. Where did Socrates come up short with regard to, say, questioning, or as he says, persuading the laws of Athens to do better? Right? And if that's the case, if his situation is any sort of indication, right, it seems that Socrates' failings with regard to what he's argued and under what circumstances might suggest that we're all to some extent called upon to make these sorts of arguments with regard to the laws of Athens. Right? And again, I've given you too much. So. Um, again, video material goes over this, and um, I look forward to your Socrates responses. Now, on to what is effectively page two of this test, on to Plato. Um, like I say, this is a weird dialogue wherein Plato is kind of flirting, and um, you have him out of context, and uh, on top of that, it's, 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 it's about a desirous form of love and what possible benefit it might actually. So this is one of the rare moments where Plato tries to find a good place, a productive place for desire, rather than drawing a hard distinction between them. Right? It's important to note because Socrates draws a, a hard distinction between desire and reason. Right? They, they basically, when people opine and desire and act on their own interests and that sort of thing, they're not acting rationally. What Socrates was arguing is that we should act rationally and not desirously. Plato, oddly in the Phaedrus, and uncharacteristically, frankly, in the Phaedrus, is trying to find a productive place for desire and a productive expression of this kind of desire specifically for beauty. So, three questions. First is to briefly discuss the constitution of the soul, and I give you a page reference on page 30, what we must say about its structure, offered by Plato at the start of the second speech. Now, what I don't want, what I don't want you to discuss, right, is the argument immediately before that, Right, where um, it, it starts on page 29, don't discuss this one. Every soul is immortal. That's because whatever is always in motion is immortal. Well, what moves and is moved by something else stops. Don't discuss that, right? S uh, flip down to uh, 246a. That then is enough about the soul's immortality. Now, here is what we must say about its structure to describe what this whole act is uh, actually is would require a long account altogether a task for the god in every way to, but to say what it's like is humanly possible and takes less time 
I've given you a lot of material with regard to um, this. I've given you pie charts. I've given you, you know, all of that. If you want to include a pie chart, that's fine, but you have to unpack the pie chart in writing in the content of your paragraphs. So basically, it's what I want is a discussion of the constitution or structure of the soul, not about the, the, the soul's immortality. And so that's sufficiently unpacked. So first sentence of question. Br briefly discuss the constitution of the soul and the treatment offered by Plato at the, the, the start of Socrates' second speech. So that's the background you've just supplied for your response. Discuss how Plato's description of the cons uh, constitution of the soul might expand what I call the moral psychology of Socrates as introduced in our discussion of the Apology. Now, this is, this is why it's important um, to actually listen to these videos, because I'm going to point you in the right direction with regard to this. The moral psychology of Plato. Right? Era of Socrates is an interesting sort of thing. Remember I laid out the Socratic dicta, knowledge is virtue, those that know the good do the good, and evil arises as an involuntary error due to ignorance. It's an interesting position, but it's one that cannot explain how somebody can know the good and just bloody well not do it, right? or know that their action is probably the wrong thing to do, but go ahead and do it anyway. Right? It cannot explain that. Right? Whereas, the constitution of the soul, where there are these parts of the soul that are at least initially in an unideal, but for most of us, situation where, you know, our better elements are opposed to this dark horse, to not unpack the metaphor for you, because that's your job, right, might explain how this tension can provide a situation where intellectually we know the good, but we don't want to do it, right? So um, basically I'm asking you to engage um, with, with that debate on the basis of your understanding of Plato's discussion of the structure of the soul, all right? So um, you see, I'm not asking you these questions because I'm a jerk. I'm, I'm asking you them because I think you can do it. Right. Um, these are interesting and I think important positions. Right. Uh, we should all think about, you know, the the tensions that exist within us as we try to make choices. Right. If they're inborn tensions, right, then the the discussion's not over. We can still, as Plato suggests, sort of try to manage these tensions and bring our soul or psyche into a form of harmony. Right. We all know that within us there is this tension between what we want and what we know we ought to do, right? How best to manage that is the question, and I think an important one that emerges through Plato's um, Phaedrus and other dialogues as well, right? So, that's that question. I look forward to reading those responses. Um, question five. One of the chief elements of Plato's defense of love is that it brings us closer to, a knowledge, uh, to knowledge of the perfect truth of the forms. So, what do I want to do? want you to do? Uh, briefly introduce Plato's theory of the forms and theory of recollection. Right? That, that is, these are the forms, this is how we come to know them. So, metaphysics, epistemology. Right? Um, that it, Plato's theory of forms beginner video will be useful for you. Um, with regard to this, as well as I, I do a quick job on my video um, of introducing at least the theory of the forms, um, it, but nonetheless the theory of recollection is in there as well. Now, here's how we relate from the general position from Plato to the specific one that's introduced in the Phaedrus. How does the special character of beauty serve to justify Platonic love in the context of this argument. Remember, the overarching argument is about whether we should give our favors to someone who loves us or shun the lover and basically have a friends with benefits kind of relationship. Right? 
Um, they've just gone through with Lysias' speech and Socrates' first speech two arguments that actually show that there are a lot of problems with uh, desire as it, uh, the overpowering desire, right, of, of love. Look at the definition on your page 18 of Eros. Right, um, the overpowering desire that 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 overpowers a person's considered impulse to do right is driven to take pleasure in beauty. It's a force reinforced by its kindred desires for beauty in human bodies is all conquering, and it's forceful drive and takes its name from the word for force. And it's called eros. How did I do there? I think pretty good. I've been at this a while. Page eighteen. Do, 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 the unreasoning desire, that, that was my error, right? It's the unreasoning desire. You see, he's opposed it to reason to some extent, right? Now, beauty's a special case, though, and um, I'll get the page reference for you. No, it's 39, isn't it? Uh, memory today, it's not enough of the coffee stuff. I'll take a sip. There, that's going to get my memory kicking. Well, um, <clears throat> here's the passage that talks about the special character of beauty. Well, at page 39, right by 250D, well, that was for love of a memory that made me stretch out my speech and longing for the past. Now, beauty longing for the past theory of recollection you got it. Now beauty, as I said, was radiant among the other objects and now that we have come down here uh, we grasp it sparkling through the clearest of our senses. Vision, of course, is the sharpest of our bodily senses, although it does not see wisdom. It would awaken a terribly powerful love if an image of wisdom came through our sight as clearly as beauty does, and the same uh, and the same goes for the other objects of inspired love. Right? Truth, be uh, truth, virtue, right? these things we can't actually see. Right? It, draw me a picture of justice, for example. Right? Basically, what you're doing is using a symbol to bring out an abstract concept which, really, if we want to understand, we've got to think our way to. But beauty, we can see. So the question is, why is that handy-dandy with regard to coming to know the perfect truth of the forms? Go. Right? That's your task right, for that question. And again, I've given you too much. Now, question number six, um, and the final question. Right? It, re remember that video that I gave you on the pre-Socratics? Right? This will come in handy here. It's still posted to Moodle. You've got access to it. It's part of the course material, so you're expected to know it. Um, and here it is. A bonus element of Plato's metaphysics, his theory of the forms, the theory of the soul, and epistemology, his theory of recollection is that it serves to resolve the contradiction between Heraclitus and Parmenides that we discussed in, quote, general introduction and pre-Socratics video. Right. Briefly discuss how these elements of Plato's position accomplish this. Remember, for Heraclitus, right, you can't step into the same river twice. What's the constant in the universe on the basis of our senses? Change, multiplicity, and general flux. Right? Everything's in a state of flux. Right. But it all makes a certain kind of sense because we have reason and language, logos, that allows us to isolate principles that explain the change, multiplicity, and flux. There's Heraclitus. Hermetides, on the other hand, claimed that being is simply that which is, that which is not, cannot be, and can't even be spoken of, which is a fancy way of saying that, well, being is simply that which is, if we're going to use, in any sort of rational way, an explanatory concept, we should be able to say something intelligent, intelligible about it. Right? Unfortunately, in terms of Parmenides, he's pointed out that the only intelligible thing that we can say about non-being, that which is not, is that it's not. 
We can say all sorts of things about things that have being. This is a white cup with a brown band and a black lid containing coffee. Th that unfortunately I made too sweet. Uh, this is a black mouse that I use to move my pointer around on my computer, which I'm recording this video from. This is a green chalkboard on a green wall, and maybe you can't tell that my, my, my camera is weird. I'm wearing a white shirt. It's quite comfortable. I can say all sorts of intelligible things about things that exist. But non-being, nothingness, all I can say is that it's not. Right? Problem is that when we go to explain change, we use nothingness as an explanatory concept all the bloody time. Right? So by Parmenides' position, which calls question to the evidence of our sense data, non-being makes no sense whatsoever, so everything that relies on non-being, change multiplicity flux, cannot be. Everything is one. Right? So Heraclitus on one side, Parmenides on the other, both seem like pretty good arguments. You can't lick that nothingness question unless you can say something positive about something negative, and you can't, right? Because it is that it's not, right? Um, so effectively, we've got a contradiction here. Right? Now, Plato's position is interesting because, remember, theory of forms, they are completely what they are. Well, there are many cats, there is but one form of cat, right? You know, they don't change, they're not subject to flux or anything along those lines. Theory of the forms, Parmenides gets to be right. Whereas, down here in the world that we exist in, right, we know that there are many cats. My cat's big, fat, and black, right? And a boy, and in Canada, right? Your cat might be different. And we all know that there are other cats out there that bear no resemblance to the cat that I have at home or you have at home, right? There is multiplicity, and we know things come into being and they pass away. There is flux, right? But, right? Plato's got that covered, too, in the world of appearance given to us by our deceptive sentence, uh, senses, things come into being and pass away. Yet, from down here, what do we do? We use reason and language. Plato points out in here that, in fact, um, it, language, to a certain extent, we're already kind of using the forms. Where is it? Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Yeah, here it is on page 36. But the soul that never saw the truth cannot take human shape, since a human being must understand speech in terms of the general forms proceeding uh, to bring many perceptions together into a reasoned unity. Thus, er, that process is the recollection of the things the soul saw when it was traveling with the God, when it was disregarded, uh, uh, the th uh, when it disregarded the things that we now call real, and is lifted up its head to what is truly real instead. Sort of poetic there, but nonetheless, right? It's it's kind of like ragu. It's all in there, right? So Heraclitus gets to be right in the realm of the appearance appearances. We see many things coming into being, passing away, and everything is in. A, world of flux, but how do we make sense of this? We use reason and language, speech, the general forms through theory of recollection to bring everything into reasoned unity. Uh, and Heraclitus's position says that to some extent what we're seeing is the unity of that which we see as opposite. Uh, so Heraclitus gets to be right, Parmenides gets to be right, there's no contradiction anymore. Right? All had, Plato had to do was split the human being into body and soul, radically distinct, and the universe into two different aspects, the world of appearances and the realm of the forms, radically distinct, never the twain shall meet, except in the human soul or psyche. Right? So, um, again, I've just given you way too much there. Um, so. Anyhow, I look forward to reading your responses, and um, on this first test, I'm going to be comment heavy. All right? I'll give you lots of comments that are designed to help you succeed on future tests and assignments. Right? I'm well aware that a philosophy course, for many of you, is something 
new, right? It, we're looking for arguments and looking for a way of looking at texts that an English major, a poli-sci major, or a sociologist, or a social worker, or a nurse, right, might not be used to. Right? So, I, really, what I'm trying to do is sort of shepherd you to a way of looking at things, not claiming it's the only way to look at things, or even the best way of looking at things, but nonetheless. And it's the way that the course needs to look at things. It's a new way of looking. Right? Anyhow, um, please email me if you have any questions whatsoever, and um, have good days, one for each of you. All right.